Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to uh, speak here today at the conference. And firstly, let me confess that other than you may have gathered from the uh, program, I'm actually not a scholar. Uh, I'm not even particularly noticeable or knowledgeable in the, uh, in the field of uh, human rights and international law. I came uh, to the presidency of Erasmus University, not through the academic ranks, but after 25 years in the international business world. So let me just uh, declare that uh, by way of interest. Um, I am a lawyer by training, uh, though, and, uh, and I have been a human rights uh, activist for as long as I can remember, serving on the board of uh, refugees associations here in this country, and having been an active supporter of amnesty for as long as I can remember since my school days. So my remarks here will be uh, slightly colored by that background, and uh, forgive me for that. Uh, having said that, it is a real pleasure to share some of my thoughts with you today, and there are many issues um, relating to human rights which are very close to my heart and I will single out one today and I'd like to speak uh, about injustice. Injustice, not justice, injustice. Uh, injustice as, uh, as I perceive it at least and I'm sure you do too to some extent and the interesting thing is that this is injustice which exists often within the boundaries of existing law international law as well as domestic law. And my argument today will be um, that the protection of refugees is not just a matter of humanitarian effort, it's not just a matter of expediency, of, of budgetary constraints, or of politics or political controversy. Um, it's also not merely a moral obligation, it is simply a fundamental issue of human rights. And then if we accept that, my second argument will be that the EU is currently failing to observe the international human rights framework relating to refugee protection. So I will go through these arguments by examining a number of popular beliefs, which certainly in this country we can hear every day and we can read when we read the press. And we'll test these popular beliefs against some of the human rights framework issues that I think the EU member states have all signed up to. Now, we all know that we live in uh, troubling times, and I won't go into that. I'm sure in these two days we have seen plenty of examples of that. And with the escalation of the conflict situations uh, in several sub-Saharan and African countries, and North African countries, and with the new stories that are overflowing us uh, of images of boat refugees perishing in the Mediterranean or withering on the Italian beaches, etc., etc., it's very clear that the, the need for refugee uh, protection is there, and it's more urgent than perhaps ever before in our history. However, the response of most EU countries including, to my great personal embarrassment, my own country, the Netherlands, has been to tighten up the regulations and the policies with the sole aim of keeping refugees out or sending them back where they came from. Now, I choose as my point of departure Article 1 of the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Any law scholar will know that. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Eloquent words, compelling words, written in 1948, and they still resonate. However, I don't know about you, but if I, I may have missed the plot, but I haven't seen or heard many references to Article 1 in the public debate lately. And I would argue that the world is in desperate need of something else, of a more compelling and a more compassionate vision when it comes to refugees. And certainly this country, the Netherlands, with its long tradition of tolerance and openness, is certainly in desperate need of such a compassionate vision. So I'll give you a personal statement here. I personally cringe when I hear politicians speak about budget constraints as a justification for not contributing 
to the maritime and relief operations in the Mediterranean. I am personally embarrassed as a citizen of this country to witness how harshly we deal with people who have lost all their worldly goods and more before fleeing their countries of origin to seek asylum in this free democracy. And I am personally deeply, deeply concerned about our collective unwillingness to reach out to those who are in great need and welcome more than just a handful of refugees in this country per year and expecting that other countries will just stretch their absorption capacity beyond reasonable limits. My heart bleeds for the millions of displaced people in countries like Lebanon, like Jordan, like Turkey, who have nowhere to go and nothing to look forward to. Now, we don't exactly live in times where compassion or generosity or understanding our values that help politicians win elections. Actually, it's quite the contrary, or so it seems. The more muscle language we hear, the better it is for the voters. And I sometimes wonder if we truly consider these millions and millions of displaced people as truly free and equal, as meant in the UN Universal Declaration. Certainly in this country, we don't seem to treat them as such. And we only have to pay a short visit, a visit to one of the shelters for displaced people, which are condoned by the local municipalities, or, or even to some of the formal detention centers that we have in this country for asylum seekers, which are instituted by the government. We only have to pay them a very small visit to understand that we institutionally degrade people and we withhold some of their fundamental human rights. These people are here, they have nowhere to go, and we treat them as problems, we treat them as statistics, we treat them as political burdens to get rid of. They face mandatory detention without ever, ever having committed a crime. And once our punitive system has exhausted their case and these people are out on the streets, we deny refugees even the basic rights to food and shelter unless they agree to leave the country. For most, there is just no line of sight to proper education or to a life as a normal citizen of this country. So the gap between the rhetoric of the UN and the reality is huge and the gap continues to widen. There is commitment of governments globally and nationally to protect the refugees, but that commitment is weakening with every escalation of conflict around the world. And what we see in many countries, including the Netherlands, is that local communities, NGO initiatives are stepping in where governments fail to act. So recently, for example, we saw mayor, mayors here or cities declaring that no person shall be left out on the street. Uh, or we see civil society stepping in and opening their doors to protect refugees, and that's condoned by the authorities. They don't intervene. But such initiatives are just not enough. They're insufficient to tackle the problem at its roots. Now, I don't have a lot of time today, so I won't give you complete root cause analysis of why the political system uh, fails. But I do want to focus on some of the treacherous consequences of some of the political arguments that we often hear. And, and I also want to offer the beginning of a vision uh, for an alternative, more human rights-based uh, approach to policy. So let me just mention three arguments that I often hear um, to justify refugee policies which are based on deterrence and keeping the gates closed and preventing people to attempt to enter the country or even the continent. First argument, we only want to protect real refugees, not economic or luck-seeking bogus <coughs> refugees. Now that's a very dangerous argument because it assumes that bogus refugees are some well-established notion in international law, and of course it's not. It is not. It's not okay to discriminate between different categories of people. It's deceptively simple and yet dangerously on the slippery slope of human rights protection. Second argument, we should encourage people to seek refuge in their own region. 
Again, deceptively simple and attractive. Push the problem back to where it originated, wash your hands in innocence. And we know for a fact that refugees are not safe in their country of origins or in their region of or origins. They face tremendous, tremendous risk. And the prejudice against uh, refugees that we increasingly see all over the world, you know, they're the root of all, equal, of all evil. It's an unhelpful and dangerous uh, prejudice. This, the, it leads to a lot of, uh, of unprecedented violence, let alone the tremendous financial and social burden that we put on neighboring countries. We're not funding the UN to extend aid, uh, and we're expecting that people will just subside. Just imagine the world in five years' time if we allow that situation to fester. Millions of displaced people living in subhuman conditions for a prolonged period of time. Just imagine how that will offer fertile recruitment ground for jihadists. Third argument, we should redirect our resources to resolve the root cause of the refugee problem, which is political, social, military conflict. Of course we should. And we should at the same time tackle the refugee problem. It's not either or, it's both. Now, the sad fact that this world is an unwelcoming place. Millions are forced into the margins. We have over 10 million refugees, over 18 million internally displaced people, and I'm sure that number is understated. Uh, some countries in the, EU, in the EU are uh, offering slightly um, more hope. Sweden and Germany are more generous than the rest of the UK. But on the whole, the EU policies remain based on deterrence. Now, I promise you not just a depressing picture, but also some contours of what it might look like. So let me offer to wrap up my personal wish list for politicians in this country to whom I give my vote. So my personal statement, dear politicians, I hope you're listening. Three wishes, only three. One, in shaping public policy, please operate from a notion of human rights protection rather than from the mindset of deterrence. Commit to fundamental equality. Nobody deserves less rights because they happen to be displaced. And give refugees a voice and empower them to join the debate on shaping policy. Refugee protection is a human rights issue. Two, Please stop talking about people who are just trying their luck in a rich country or parasites or bogus refugees when you're referring to refugees. Using that pejorative rhetoric undermines public support for human rights and uh, for protection. It contributes to prejudice. Please stop it. Use instead language of compassion and understanding rooted in principles of international law. And thirdly, my last and remaining wish, Please, politicians, embrace and strengthen the notion of international solidarity. Do not see your country as tackling the, this, this issue unilaterally. You're not on your own. In the EU and even in the world at large, we are all in the same boat. Please embrace collective responsibility for global cross-border issues of human rights protection. Redirect tax money adequately fund the UN agencies to carry out their work in conflict regions. And most importantly, please, 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 politicians, remember that no country can be successful in a world that fails. <laughs>